The ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to put your hands together for Steve Howard. Uh, that's quite an introduction. I'd better try and do that justice. Thank, thanks, Jim. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. And there's uh, lots of uh, friends and familiar faces and uh, lots of experience in the room. So uh, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes before Joe pro gives me the grilling he's promised over Twitter. Uh, and then we go into a, a discussion. Um, I, it was four years ago, I joined IKEA, actually, Jim. So everything else was right. But it was, like, it was four years ago. Uh, three sounds like it, you've done it a lot faster. Um, and the interesting thing, anybody who's, who's joined a large business knows you, you, uh, you stand on the shoulders of those who went before you. Um, and, you know, so that, uh, as a, a business that's been around 60 years, which had a long history of working first on efficiency, then on social issues, then more on environmental issues, and gradually developing them, uh, IKEA didn't start doing this stuff when I turned up, much as I would like to say it was all me. Uh, the other thing is, in a 147,000-person business last count, I always introduce myself internally as co-responsible for sustainability with everybody else in the business. And uh, the first time I, I said that, it seemed a bit trite. I just sort of said it. And then I thought, oh my god, that's absolutely true, really. Um, it's probably the same for every other management function, just nobody realizes it, really. So you're dependent on the person in a store doing logistics who chooses to make sure the recycling's well done. You're dependent on the product developer who's making sure that we've got next generation textiles. You're, de develop, you're dependent on someone in corporate finance who's making sure you're following up on the wind farm deals you've committed to. Um, so, uh, and there's something actually quite humbling. Uh, IKEA is a values-driven business. Uh, it's got a, a Swedish-founded uh, culture, which uh, I think the, the best elements of that are that it promotes positive human behavior. You're sort of team-orientated, you're consensus-seeking, you keep pretty grounded, and as a member of the management team, after a meeting, you tidy up and put stuff in the dishwasher, which is kind of good, because you realize you know, everybody's just people at the end of the day in a big business. Uh, I'm just going to spend a, a couple of minutes just telling you stuff you already know, but this may be useful. This is how um, I frame sustainability in IKEA and how my colleagues do now as well. I'm going to briefly describe the three things we do, but I'm not going to go into all 60 high-level commitments we've made and things like that, because we'll be here until way past drinks, and Joe would get impatient with me. Um, and, uh, and then we'll get into a conversation with, with Joe. So the stuff I, I do, you know, we're a home furnishing business. You know, so we're practical. Like, I don't know uh, of the, the businesses that people work for here or the organizations, but we've got very practical people. And so to, to make sustainability something that's accessible to everybody, uh, is really important. So we do sustainability in three or four numbers. The fourth one's optional, if you're feeling clever. Um, and you know the numbers. It's just a nice way of framing it so it's memorable. So the first one, you know, one and a half planets. Everybody knows that. We're over-consuming the resources. We went, we're in a bank. Uh, so we went into planetary deficit in 1980, if we, we like to talk about deficits. Um, and that's obviously that deficit is worsening. So the one and a half planets, everybody gets that. Three billion extra middle class coming 2030, 2035, around that time, which is fantastic news for people coming out of poverty. And uh, we don't want to save the planet by keeping people poor. We want people to come out of poverty as fast as possible. Uh, but when you put those three billion extra uh, mid middle class, those extra consumers together with that first number, you realize, actually, this is, that's the next 15 years. We're making plans that far out as a business. This, is, it's, uh, this shows that sustainability has become something that uh, is kind of sustainability or bust for us as a business and for wider society. Next number, one and a half, three. There's a nice pattern to this. Six is uh, six degrees. Now, you can quibble out the number, but if you say we've warmed the planet by one degree, that the long-term trajectory we're currently on is six degrees, three and a half to four degrees this century. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to change this talk after Paris in December. Uh, until that time, I'll go with uh, the, the six degrees as the long-term path we're on. And the, the chief economist at the International Energy Agency, Fatih Barol, uh, he says, you know, if you 
keep on the path you're on, sooner or later you get where you're heading. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a business leader. I hope that's true. You know, if you keep on the path, if you lay down plans, you get where you're heading. Unfortunately, the path we're on now is a six degree path, which is obviously not the right path. So we need a radical course correction. So one and a half, three, six. You know, the fourth one uh, is optional. Uh, it's 12. Uh, my uh, grandma was born in Manchester, 1901, actually. And uh, that was the ninth largest city in the world at the time. And there were 12 cities with a population of a million people or more. So 12 cities just over 100 years ago with a, a million people or more. There's 500 today. And if we looked back in 1,000 years or a million years at this point in history and said, when did we build all the world cities? When was the peak time? They'd say, right about now. Almost this evening is peak city building time on the history of humanity. Um, because from 1950 to 2050, we go from 750 million people to 6.3 billion in cities. Every other century was practice. And cities lay down a blueprint for how we live, how we work, how we transport our goods and ourselves, our energy systems. So sustainability is mission critical right now. It's on our watch as uh, business leaders, organizations, NGOs. It's on our watch. It's as simple as that. And uh, I think there was a, a my, the chairman of our board, I don't know if you'd thank me for quoting him on this, but I may find out after tonight. Um, uh, Joran said to me, actually, sustainability was a bit like something the cat dragged in before I joined the organization, which is they knew they had to do something with it, but nobody really knew what or want, what. We hadn't actually managed to make it something that was uh, really business relevant. We were doing many good things across IKEA, but it was, didn't feel really relevant for the business, and it didn't feel like we had a vision. It, why us? You know, we're a home furnishing business. Um, so we worked really hard, and I think a couple of the lessons for me in joining an organization, uh, I got, got some good advice, actually. Uh, a good friend of mine said, you've got two ears and one mouth when you join the organization. Uh, so listen to people, learn a lot about the business. What have people done already? Where's the competence and expertise? What's special about the business, really? And I did that really intensively for quite a long time, actually. Uh, I sort of thought maybe I should have a 100-day plan. Maybe this comes into your 365-day thing. What do you do in the first 365 days? I'd say really learn where you are in the first 365 days. You know, we can sometimes be in an indecent hurry to prove impact uh, as individuals. And yes, we did do some things. But realistically, in that first year, I worked intensively with colleagues to reframe a strategy. Uh, we didn't initiate lots of new programs. We really uh, worked out what are the business done. And we said um, some simple stuff. And other businesses have said this. Now, so I, I'm not going to pretend that we're a perfect business uh, at all, uh, or that we're only, the only business in the world doing this sort of thing. But uh, we said we want our business to have a positive impact on the world. And uh, my former CEO, Mikhail, who hired me, uh, despite my uh, comment to him, which Jim mentioned, uh, uh, Mikhail says it's good if you look at a strategy, always flip it the other way around and see how it sounds, uh, and see if that sounds better. So we want our business to have a negative impact on the world doesn't sound great. Actually, if a lot, a lot of businesses stood up today honestly and said, you know, what do you think? Do you think you can make your business have a positive impact? If they were truly honest, some businesses would have to question that. Um, and it's our job, I think, to absolutely make sure we have a positive impact on society and on the environment. So we call the strategy People and Planet Positive. Yeah, you know, it is exactly what it says on the can, People and Planet Positive. We've got three change drivers. Uh, we want to help and enable our customers to live a more sustainable life at home because they want to, and they want it to be easy, affordable, and attractive. Uh, we want our operations to be completely sustainable through energy and resource independence, and we want to have a, a positive impact on people and communities who participate in our value chain. Uh, those three change drivers. And I, I've had entire rooms full of senior managers in the business or general management or country teams stand up and repeat the change drivers. The art, I, we have 11 strategies. So we have a, sustainability is a cornerstone of our business. I sit in the nine person management team that leads IKEA. We have uh, sustainability as a cornerstone. We have 11 group strategies. Uh, sustainability is woven into lots of them. And then we have a sustainability strategy. 
there, all business plans are driven off that. The difference between an okay strategy or poor strategy and a good one is simplicity. And if you cannot repeat what's in it and expect others to do so, it's very hard to guide a 147,000 person business. Of course, you can have sub-strategies and sub-commitments. Um, anyway, with our first change driver, um, uh, helping people to live a more sustainable life at home, we've looked at that and said, where can we help actually uh, have products that help people save energy, save water, uh, reduce waste or save waste, or now even generate energy? And then we set a, a sales target because that makes it business relevant. So we said, we'll name all of those products where there's an ad additional benefit, we'll develop some more, and we'll grow that at the twice the rate of growth as a business. So, so the business should more or less double by, uh, between when we launched this two years ago and 2020 in size, so we'll grow four times. The, uh, we actually, in the last 12 months, we just announced we had a 58% increase uh, in, in those, the sales of those products uh, to over a billion now, which I was quite pleased about, I have to be honest, um, when we tracked that. And one of them was a bit of a leap of faith, and um, I'm going to sort of say things that I think are, they, they're not hard and fast rules, but they're pretty good rules to operate by. If we said the environmental community, of which I have been, I'm, I would still say I'm a member of the environmental community, the social community as well, but um, uh, maybe message wrongly to start off with. It, we, sustainability was all about compromise. It was about the, the first CFL lights that took five minutes to warm up and then everybody looked like a zombie. Uh, or the, the toilet paper that was like sandpaper. The reason, what an innovation that is, you know? how to win the hearts and minds of consumers. So we, we actually had lots of uh, products that really weren't better, and everybody wants better. So if we, you know, for sustainability, it has to be easier, more attractive, more affordable. Otherwise, we are uh, pushing a big boulder up a hill constantly. Um, so we looked at what we could do. We had a small LED range, just uh, this is going back uh, three and a half years ago. And I sit on our lighting business council. I made a simple request that how fast could we go 100% LED? The guys came back two months later. They said, we think we might possibly be able to get there by 2016. We took a decision as a business then to say, OK, let's, let's self-limit and we'll eliminate CFLs and halogens and just have fantastic LEDs. And that means when you go all in for better products, when you go 100%, you no longer make the investment you are about to make in slightly better CFLs. And you really understand, how do you get to scale and volumes behind something like LEDs? So we've now got um, you know, products that will last more than 20 years in normal use, that are fantastic in terms of color rendition. I'm not, tr not trying to sell you uh, LEDs, but it doesn't matter if you rush out and buy some, but I'm not trying to sell you them. It's just to say, what's the development over that period? Fantastic color rendition, great color temperature, fantastic longevity as products at a great price. And just over a year ago, our customers responded because they suddenly recognized the value proposition. And this last financial year, which finished last September, uh, we'd sold more than 75% more than of our lights were LEDs. And uh, that we'd sold enough LEDs to save the energy of the, of the households in a decent sized city. Uh, We'll sell more than twice that this year, and by 1st of September, we will be 100% LED, only selling LEDs as one of the largest retailers of lights in the world. Um, so we've looked at what else can we do around induction hobs, water-saving taps. We've started selling solar panels here in the UK, in the Netherlands and Switzerland, to see and really explore, can we get a great value proposition? We've had people come into IKEA looking for towels and uh, going home with solar panels. And that sounds like an aggressive case of upselling, but actually, the people are, when you get a sort of more or less uh, seven or eight year payback, it's a fantastic piece of upselling. If people walk away, they walk away really happy with something that's a great investment for them, that they can be proud of, that halves their electricity bills, and that's better than any, pretty much anything you can do as an ordinary householder with your, with your money. Um, on the energy and resource side, I won't, I'm, we're obviously doing the normal things. We're, uh, we're making fantastic progress. I got an update uh, just a day or so ago on, on pursuing FSC wood and recycled wood. And we're probably the largest retailer of, of FSC wood in the world now. 
uh, well over six million cubic meters of, of certified wood. Um, so we're doing the normal things around that. We're going all in 100% for better cotton we, and more sustainable cotton, which we should hit uh, by 2015 this year as well. So we've got comprehensive targets around uh, resources and how we source resources. On the energy side, I know, I know uh, Jim likes this and uh, nudged me before on that. Um, we're a long-term business, so we, we own our stores, we own the land the stores are built on, we own some of our own factories, some of the largest furniture and particle board factories in the world. So it's a natural thing for us to sort of vertically integrate into energy. And when you look at uh, my numbers, my one and a, or our numbers, one and a half, three, six, et cetera, uh, you'd have to say, actually, it's a pretty sensible thing to take control of your, your energy consumption. So we set a target as part of our strategy to say, let's be energy independent by 2020. By 2020, we will produce more renewable energy than the energy we consume in our business, and we'll couple it back wherever we can. So uh, we've just about invested a, a billion euros in, in wind and some other areas. We've uh, about half a billion or so in solar. Uh, we've installed, last count, 700,000 solar panels. I'm pretty sure it's way beyond that right now. And we've got about, uh, um, where we've, got, we've actually got 20 wind farms with nearly 300 wind turbines, about two-thirds of which are spinning today. Uh, about a third comes online this calendar year, a couple of particularly big wind farms in the US that we've invested in. And we'll keep going with that. So by uh, this September, we should be around the 70% level. That was our milestone for, for this year to get to 70% renewable energy. It delivers a good return on investment. It's not philanthropy. Uh, we had access to the capital. Uh, it's a sensible thing for us to do. And we free ourselves of the concern over the carbon and the, the future energy prices. It's a very popular thing within the business. And as I've said, it's great for our CFO as well as the CSO. Um, on the people and communities, I'm going to wrap quickly so Joe can start commence his grilling. Uh, on people and communities, we have about 600,000 people in tier one factories. Uh, as I mentioned, 147,000 co-workers. Um, we've looked at our, our co-workers uh, first and uh, in this last year, actually we got a fantastic headline, which was something along the lines of uh, flat, flat pack profits, because our profitability was about the same level as the year before, which was great, it was fine. We're perfectly happy with the profits. Um, the reason why they didn't increase was because about 10% of the profits we actually decided to put into a universal staff bonus scheme. So it was about uh, sharing uh, things more evenly across the business. Which, it, and it was interesting, uh, in a, the bonus scheme in, in the sort of extended group management, the 250 or so people leading the business, many people had said they would forego their bonus if it meant uh, that we could share bonuses with everybody uh, I think they're glad that we've not had to take them up on that offer, though, really. But I think there was a genuine sentiment there that you want to work in a business where uh, everybody has decent pay and benefits and good opportunities. And uh, we've also done some work around living wage, fair wage, which is very challenging to work on because it's subjective. Um, so we've uh, rolled out living wage in the US. Uh, and we found out in our Japanese business that um, in the retail sector, you could pay people less if they, for the same hourly, hourly piece of work if they were part-time. So you had uh, a very widespread use of part-timers, obviously, in all the retail sector, and also in Japan, many of whom happened to be women. Uh, and this wasn't acceptable to us as a business, so we worked through with the Labour Ministry and with the business, and we equalised paying conditions for full and part-time workers. It created a business case for lots more uh, full-time workers and really drove, I think it was a, a big step forwards into the 21st century, really. Uh, so to make these changes purposely, knowing you not, not everything is perfect, in a big business, over time you're constantly having to improve. Uh, and now we're doing sort of fair wage network assessments in three countries in our supply chain, uh, looking at so the issue. So we already do, I have 100 auditors working in my matrix, we do more than 1,000 unannounced audits in the year, uh, and we maintain full com compliance. When we went for full compliance against our code of conduct, uh, we, we really aligned the business behind it. And this comes with this sort of, Jim said, going all in, the really being focused on 100%. You know, believe it, if you can have a 100% target, it is so much easier. You know, uh, 
If you have a 90% target, then more than 10% of people will construct the case to be in the 10%. I guarantee it. Uh, if you have a 50-50 target, you've totally confused the entire business, really. So 100% target for compliance was really easy. And then we ended up parting company with 75 suppliers who chose not to comply. Uh, but that was anchoring it within the whole business. Now it's much easier to maintain compliance. The suppliers who'd worked really hard to do a great job on the code of conduct feel that we're a serious business and are happy with what they've done. Um, uh, so the, uh, the message that comes from that for me is really create clarity for your business and go all in.